Hi everybody. Welcome to Ordinary Differential Equations, the mathematical framework and tools for understanding, modeling, and predicting anything that moves. Hi, welcome back to the third lecture of Chapter 3. In this lecture, I'm going to consider an example that brings together all of the concepts we developed earlier in the chapter. And it is an example that we can understand completely. So here's the example. It's a second order autonomous ODE. X dot equals minus X, Y dot equals Y squared times the quantity one minus Y squared. Now, the first thing you notice about this is that it is two uncoupled one dimensional ODEs. X naught does not depend upon Y, Y dot does not depend upon X, but still many, many advanced concepts can be learned from this example. So the first thing you do, my advice, is the simplest thing possible. Find the equilibrium points. Okay, so those are the points at phase space, X comma Y, where X dot and Y dot vanish simultaneously. So X has to be zero, so you have to be on the Y axis, and Y dot for it to be zero, you have y equals zero and y equal plus or minus one. So I write them down here. All right, now a point to notice is that we have from this four invariant lines. Okay, think about what that means. And uh, how do I get to that conclusion? So if I set x equals 0, you see that x dot equals 0. So setting x equals 0 means I'm on the y-axis. So if I start on the y-axis, I stay on the y-axis because the x component cannot change. So that's one line. And I get three other lines from the equilibrium points of the y dot equation. If I start at y equals 0 on the x-axis, y dot is always zero, so y never changes from y equals zero. And similarly, for y equals plus or minus one. Okay, so these are examples, these four lines are examples of invariant sets. So when I gave the example of an invariant set, I said, okay, an a set is invariant is if you start in it, you stay in it. Fine, but how do you prove that? Well, I have proved it just now from these equations, but there's something a little more advanced going on. If your set has a nice smooth structure so that you can define the tangent vector to each point in the set, the manifestation of invariance would be that the vector field is always tangent to the invariant set, because then you're always moving along the invariant set. You can never get off. It doesn't have a component of the vector field transverse or perpendicular to the invariant set. And that type of idea we're going to develop throughout the course in much more complicated situations. Okay, so let's plot the phase portrait. That is the, the structure of the phase space, which has, tells us how all of the trajectories are related and interact with each other. So the way we can do that is the way we've done it already for the one-dimensional example from earlier on. Let's plot the x dot phase space by itself, the y dot phase space by itself, and put them together. So x dot equals minus x. We know that the phase space for that looks like this. It has an equilibrium point at the origin. And any other initial condition, the trajectory through that initial condition will approach the origin asymptotically as time goes to infinity. The y component, well, if we plot f of y, which remember was y squared 1 minus y squared, that's what the graph is here, and we see that um, we see the three equilibrium points, and the sign of the vector field in between. So if we plot the three equilibrium points, and the arrows indicate whether the direct 
vector field that's positive or negative, increasing or decreasing, and we have this picture. So if we put them together, this is what the phase portrait looks like. And this tells us everything about how trajectories will behave. That is, if I take an arbitrary initial condition, I know exactly what it's going to do. So, what about uh, attracting invariant sets? Well, y equal 1, that line is an attracting invariant set. If we start close to the line, we know that the, the y component will decrease to the line till it gets to the line. We don't care about the x component. Um, so what's the base of attraction? It's the upper half plane, because if we start any initial condition, the x component will decrease and the y component will move towards the line. All right, are there any other attracting sets? Well, the y-axis is an attracting set. Okay, because if we start in a neighborhood of that attracting set, x dot goes to zero. So we approach the y-axis. This is an unbounded attracting set. That's fine. Often we were interested in being bounded in applications. But look also what we have. It's an attracting set, but it has unstable objects within the invariant set. Now, attracting sets are wonderful for a variety of reasons. Attracting sets, if you start in them, you stay in them, but also at the same time, if you start outside them, you cannot get into them. So in that sense, they are barriers in the phase space. Trajectories cannot cross them, and that's one of the big uses for them in applications. So these four invariant lines divide up the phase space into eight regions, and if we start in any of those eight regions, we cannot go to any of the other eight regions. Go to, meaning a trajectory cannot evolve, evolve between these regions. So in some sense, the invariance sets allow us to simplify what's going on in the dynamical system, because it's, it's separated into disjoint regions that do not communicate with each other. So in some sense, also, the invariant sets enable us to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. This is a two-dimensional problem, but every trajectory is eventually going to evolve towards the y-axis. Okay, so in some sense, if we are only interested in what's going to happen in this di dynamical system, eventually, for a long time, we could just restrict ourselves to the motion on the y-axis, that is x equals zero. Now, there's a lot, if you've had some exposure to these ideas in the past, there's a lot going on, a lot of deep ideas in this simple example, and we're going to pull out ideas from simple examples as we go throughout the course. At the very end, I've picked uh, eight other invariant sets. Find out, it's, it's a useful exercise to determine how many invariant sets you can come up with in this example. And this is not all of them. Okay, this is a good place to stop. And in the next lecture, I will talk about the exercises at the end of this chapter. So bye for now.